Good morning everyone and welcome to Vineyard Church here in Harrogate. I'm Maggie and this is Nick and we are the senior pastors. It is lovely to have you joining us. We've got a few notices and then Nick is going to lead us in worship and Judith will be sharing her talk on encountering Jesus. We're also going to be sharing communion at the end of worship this morning so that gives you a little bit of time to grab some bread and wine or juice in preparation. Fab, looking forward to it. <laughs> Um, firstly, as today is Mother's Day, we wanted to let you know that we sent some lovely gift bags to the mums at the Women's Refuge. They had a card, some nice chocolates and some vouchers for beauty treatments as well. It was just to let them know that we were thinking of them at what can be a really tricky time. And we also delivered chocolates to local school teachers and staff this week. And we've had some really lovely responses. One person said, thank you for your thoughtfulness in a challenging time. And another said, it made my week. It's a stressful time, but made brighter by your church's offering. Oh, it's so good, isn't it? Yeah. And while we're focusing on generous acts of kindness, we were so pleased that as a church, We've raised nearly £700 to send to Tear Fund's Lent Appeal. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for yes. contributing. We love that this is a church that not only cares for one another, but also for our surrounding community and beyond. Yeah. And so um, don't forget that uh, our monthly dig prayer meeting is tomorrow night over Zoom. So if you're on our mailing list, you will have had an email invite last week. So just click accept and you'll receive the Zoom link. Um, or you can sign up on the website. We'll be praying together uh, from 8 till 9 p.m. on Monday. So do join us then. Smashing. So now we're going to have a time of worship where we're going to sing three simple songs. Um, and then we'd love to invite you mm. to share communion with us if you're able to grab some bread and some wine or juice. And also, as you do so, you know, maybe take a photo, please send in your pictures of your personal bread and wine <laughs> setup. It would be lovely to see that. Amen. Okay, so let's pray. Lord, we invite you to draw nearer to us now as we come to worship. Mm. Meet with each of us, wherever we are, whatever circumstance we're in. We come to worship you in spirit and in truth, which means that we bring you our heart and we bring you our lives, whether we're celebrating or whether we're struggling, because we know that you enter into that and you love us to be authentic and honest as we come to worship you. Mm. So, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Holy Spirit 
Even when I do 
when I do You don't walk out when I threaten to You are steady when I can't be still Your love finds me and it always will From the highest high to the lowest low From the mountain top to the valley below in the darkest night though i try to hide even there your light shines bright like the morning you meet me here spirit you meet me here always embracing Never rejecting your kindness drawing near. Oh, you meet me here. Spirit, you meet me here. Always embracing, never rejecting your kindness drawing. Nothing worth more that would ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're a living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen.
God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Your presence. So we're going to take a bit of time now to share communion with one another. So hopefully you've got your bread or, and wine and uh, or your juice together and that you're, you're ready to go. So um, let's take a moment to pray. Jesus, we remember you and your sacrifice of yourself so that we might have relationship with God in freedom and in love. That we might be forgiven and spend eternity with you. Be with us now, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, as we remember. Be with us now as we ask your forgiveness for the things that we have done, said or thought that have caused us to turn away from you or to harm those that you call us to love. We're sorry, Lord. Eternal God, in the cross of Jesus, we see the cost of our sin and the depth of your love. In humble hope and fear, may we place at his feet all that we have and all that we are through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we welcome your presence into our homes and into our hearts. And as we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we celebrate communion as Jesus himself told us to. So I'm just going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's share communion together. Whether you are with family or whether you are home alone, we are united in Jesus's love for each one of us. So we're going to take our bread and take a piece of the bread. And as you eat it, remember the sacrifice of Jesus, his body broken for you. Body of Jesus broken for you. Amen. The body of Jesus broken for you. Amen. And now take your wine or your juice and take a sip of the wine or juice. And as you drink it, remember Jesus's love for you, the promise of life with him, his blood poured out for you. Blood of Jesus shed for you. Amen. Blood of Jesus poured out for you. Amen. Let's just take a moment just to quietly reflect. Oh Jesus, we are so grateful. We're so grateful that you call us into relationship with yourself and that you made a way. You made a way for us when there was no way. And we are so grateful for your love for your friendship, for your kindness, and for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So now we're going to pass over to Judith and listen to the next talk in our Encountering Jesus series. Good morning. My name is Judith and I am on the team here at Harrogate Vineyard. It's great to have you with us this morning. And I hope that you are finding this series on encountering Jesus as thought provoking as I am. This week, we're going to look together at the call of Matthew Levi in Luke 5, verse 27 to 32. But before we turn to Levi, I'd like to make a few observations about where the story sits in this chapter. Chapter five begins with the call of Simon, James and John, who were fishermen scratching a living on Galilee. I don't think this was the first time they had empty net syndrome and no fish meant no money. Their hand to mouth existence would not have been uncommon, but it would at times have prevented them from engaging fully in society. From time to time, they would have found themselves on the edge, marginalized, unable to do the things that others were able to do. Taking Jesus at his word, the men let down the nets a second time and finding them too full to lift, they need help. And that miracle is followed by a promise that Jesus would make them fishers of men. This calling is then followed by two healing miracles. The first miracle is the healing of the man with leprosy. In the message version, we're told the man was covered with leprosy. The disease had made the man an outcast, so much so that his only way of making a living was to beg. Jesus does the unthinkable and touches him. He simply says the words, be clean. The man is healed. He is made clean. Jesus then shows that he has respect for the law of Moses by instructing the man to show himself to the priest and make the required offering as Moses commanded. Why? Because if the priest said the man was cleansed, then he had certainly been healed and could re-enter society. The man who had been marginalised by disease was now acceptable and his acceptance would be ratified by the priest. We are then told that Jesus was being followed by crowds to hear him and to be healed. The next story is the healing of the paralytic man. This man is so marginalised by his body being unable to move that were it not for his determined friends, he wouldn't have made it. 
In this miracle, the way Jesus operates develops and this development is going to be witnessed by all and sundry because we are told that people have come from all over to see him. Impressed by his friend's faith, the first words Jesus speaks to the paralysed man, man is, your sins are forgiven you. In saying your sins are forgiven, Jesus addresses his spiritual need. But more importantly, in addressing the spiritual, Jesus shows us who he is. He is God, a point not missed by the religious elite in the audience. Jesus also addresses the physical and speaking as it were man to man, he instructs the man to take up your bed and walk. And the barrier of paralysis is lifted. He's no longer marginalized. He's free to join society. And so we come to Levi. Luke 5 verse 27 to 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We're told that Levi is a tax collector and he was sitting in his booth. Why? Well, I think this is intentional. Like the earlier characters, Levi is marginalised. Tax collectors were deemed unclean. They were hated. And by telling us what Levi did for a living, we are in no doubt that this man was sitting on the margins of society. Because of what he did for a living, no self-respected citizen would want to hang out with him. His social circle would be made up of others who were deemed unclean, such as Gentiles, other tax collectors and the like. Levi is at work, where he would collect customs taxes from traders, taking goods from one area to another to sell, such as fish or crops that had been harvested. It's quite possible that Simon had come across Levi when he took his catch to the markets. The name Levi indicates it's likely he was part of a priestly tribe. The Levites were in a privileged position. Although they lived a hand-to-mouth existence and were unable to inherit, therefore unable to accumulate wealth, the community was required to support them. Tithes were shared among the priests, and so the Levites would see the sides of each tithe and be able to see who was wealthy and who wasn't. A man with lots of land yielding a good crop will be obviously rich. If that tithe in the form of a crop was too big to carry, or it was too far, then the equivalent value in money was acceptable. This knowledge was important to the tax collector. In order to work as a tax collector, the individual had to put in a bid to the Romans, and that bid then became the contractual amount due to the Roman authorities for that collector in that area, and anything collected over and above the bid was kept by the collector. So Levi knew who had what. As a tax collector, he was pushed to the margins of his society on many levels. His tribe, the Levites, would have rejected him as an apostate. He would have known that if he practiced extortion, then he would be taken, that would be taken as evidence that he had forgotten God. His neighbours would be likely to shun him. Who wants to be friends with someone who may start to make unreasonable demands on you when they see that you can afford the very things they can't? His family would have shunned him for rejecting the existence he'd been born into. In any event, he was unclean. And who wants to socialise with someone like that? Whatever the reasons for his marginalisation, Levi was vulnerable. If it was money he wanted, he had it, but at what cost? Without the support of his family, being unable to make any spiritual headway and with a friendship network of people just like him, 
I think Levi had started to observe Jesus. So when Jesus saw him, I think Levi felt that he had been truly seen. And that is why when Jesus said, follow me, he did. Follow me. Two words that are both an invitation and an instruction. We're told that when Jesus called the fishermen, he simply said, from now on you'll be catching men. Jesus didn't need to be explicit in that invitation. With Levi, I think he did. Because apart from tax collectors and sinners, Levi was so marginalised that he'd never receive instructions, let alone an invitation to follow anyone. When Jesus saw Levi, he saw more than a tax collector, hated by society, unclean, untrustworthy. Jesus saw Levi's deepest need. Jesus saw that beneath the veneer that Levi had carefully constructed to appear successful, beneath the wealth that he was trying to use to plug the gap between his spiritual need and his inner being, I think Jesus saw Levi not as someone who had it all, but someone who had a deep spiritual yearning. He'd been desperately trying to fill, but failing. Follow me. That instruction reached into that chasm and turned Levi inside out. I think Levi could well have been in those crowds who gathered to hear Jesus. And when Jesus saw Levi and personally invited him to follow, wild horses wouldn't have held him back. Levi is just like me. That yawning spiritual chasm exists within me, which no matter how hard I try, it can't be filled by anything except Jesus. Do you recognise this? Maybe you do. I think it's common to everyone and we all try to fill it in different ways. Drugs, sex, money, alcohol, intellectual ambition. Doing what we need to do to be part of the in crowd is as opposed to being an outsider. The list goes on. But the truth is, they're all substitutes for the real thing. And the more we try to fill that chasm with a substitute, the bigger it gets. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I'm immune. I regularly have to return to the foot of the cross for forgiveness. And I thank God that he is king of the new starts because the struggle is a daily one. Levi, like me, is being given a new start. Luke gives us a sense that Levi immediately accepts the invitation. He immediately obeyed the command. Leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Leaving everything. I think something in Levi was compelled to accept the invitation. He was compelled to obey. And I think it was because when Jesus said those words, in the context of him having seen Levi, Levi couldn't refuse. Although Levi was marginalised, he would still leave behind him a degree of comfort. He was wealthy, but something was still missing. Levi was now responding because now he identified with what Jesus was offering and that it would finally fill that spiritual chasm. I think Levi was desperate for a way out of the life he constructed, constructed and, I knew that, and I think he knew that Jesus was that way out. I think he'd seen it, the leper cleansed, a man brought to Jesus paralysed, now able to walk, and now it was his turn. But Jesus didn't just heal him of his spiritual need, Jesus went further, he invited him to follow. Jesus identified that Levi wasn't a misfit, he had potential to be a disciple. So rather than becoming sad at the thought of leaving his wealth behind, Levi follows Jesus and then throws a party. And Levi made a great feast in his house and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. Levi was celebrating a new purpose without status. That encounter with Jesus must have been something special. The detail that it was a great feast is really important because this wasn't just a BYO drink stew. The implication is that it was more like a banquet, a real celebration. Levi is a rich man 
and this great feast appears to have been a fitting tribute to his ability to wine and dine his colleagues. In throwing a party, Levi unwittingly provides an opportunity for Jesus to come into contact with his colleagues and the only other people who would be his friends. Levi became the conduit for an invitation to others on the margins of society. We are then told, and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at, Je at the disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Among the guests were Pharisees and scribes. Why? Why would they be there? Maybe these were the same ones who'd been part of the crowd earlier. They too had seen the paralysed man get up and walk and to question Jesus. Maybe Levi's invitation was to anyone who cared to come. Whoever it was to, we know that the Pharisees and scribes had something to say about it, but they didn't go to Jesus. Instead, instead, they went to the men who'd only just started to follow Jesus, asking them why they ate with tax collectors and sinners. In other words, why are you willing to make yourself unclean, associating with these unclean people? I like to think that the Pharisees were there out of genuine curiosity. Maybe they'd started to be, debate what they had seen Jesus do and what they'd heard him say. And they were now wanting to find out more about these insignificant fishermen. Maybe they were trying to understand Jesus' purpose. Whatever their reason for asking the disciples, it was Jesus who answered. And what he says is utterly staggering. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus comes in like an arrow to the target and hits the bullseye. He starts with a statement that everyone would agree with. After all, we don't need the doctor unless we're sick. In the story of the paralysed man, he'd already said that he had the authority to forgive sins. And by forgiving the sins of the paralysed man, Jesus is demonstrating that all sin is against him. That means he is claiming that he is God. Jesus then develops this earlier claim to be God by saying that he, God, had come to earth to call sinners to repentance. Now this is an astounding claim. God dwelling amongst them with one purpose, to call sinners to repentance. Where will you find those sinners? In the very places they congregate. This party that Levi throws gives Jesus the opportunity to engage with the very people he's come to save and an opportunity to, to explain his purpose further. It was no accident that Levi held a party and a lavish one at that. Levi knew that his friends and colleagues needed something that he hadn't identified until Jesus saw him in his booth, doing his work. The party was his chance to introduce Jesus to others who were like him. Last week, I was really challenged by Nick's question, what would you do if you were squashed in, this, in that house with the dirt falling on you? Some of those people may have been at this party too. What would you do? How would you respond to Jesus at the party? When I was writing this talk, I found myself identifying with Levi. His wealth was no substitute for what Jesus could offer him. Like Levi, I try and fill the gaps in my life with other things. Like Levi, I want to be seen. Each day, Jesus' invitation is, follow me. Each day, his instruction, follow me too. And yet sometimes I seem unable or unwilling to take up the invitation to follow the instruction. Yet deep down, I know that it is only in so doing that my life has any balance and purpose and my deepest needs are fulfilled. If like me, you need a new start, please join with this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the God of the second third, fourth, the umpteenth chance 
because you know we get so much wrong so much of the time. Thank you for the story of Levi and just as you saw Levi, will you see me? I'm sorry for all the times I get it wrong and have to start over again and for the times when I've filled that spiritual need with things other than you. Please forgive me. Fill me with your spirit and help me to learn from you, to walk in step with you, to follow you. In your name we pray. If you've prayed that prayer for the first time, or the millionth, please get in touch. You can do that through our website, www.harrogatevineyard.org.uk. If you're not part of a home group, why not join one? We'd love to hear from you. Goodbye and have a great week.